three years ago, in 2012, I was a U.S. State Department officer deployed to Turkey to work with the Syrian opposition. It was an amazing opportunity to support Syrian activists waging a remarkable popular struggle against a criminal regime, one that responded to peaceful protests with bullets and torture. For eight months since the start of the revolution in March 2011, Syrian Sunni Christians, Kurds, Druze, Alawites had used demonstrations, sit-ins, resistance music, colorful graffiti, consumer boycotts, and dozens of other nonviolent tactics to challenge the Assad regime. A year earlier, a book that I co-wrote with Erica Chenoweth called Why Civil Resistance Works had been published. In it, we tested the conventional wisdom that only violence works against formidable foes like dictatorships and foreign military occupations. In studying 323 violent and nonviolent campaigns from 1900 to 2006, Erica and I found that nonviolent civil resistance was twice as successful as armed struggle. We also found that nonviolent struggle helps to consolidate democracy and post conflict peace. These findings were put to the test in Syria. I get it why Syrians took up arms against the Assad regime. Even as an advocate of nonviolent resistance, I tried to put myself in their shoes and imagine seeing my mother raped, my brother starved to death, and my religion ridiculed. Tragically, however, armed struggle played into the Assad regime's hands. The level of death, destruction, and displacement skyrocketed once violence was fought with violence. And extremist elements like ISIS exploited the chaos. Syrian nonviolent resistance needed more time and more dedicated supporters. The average nonviolent campaign historically has taken three years to run its course. That sounds like a long time. The average violent campaign has taken nine years. As part of the international effort, I know that we failed. We failed collectively to help Syrians plan for a long struggle and remain resilient in the face of regime violence. We failed to provide timely and adequate support for the nonviolent resistors. This, to this day, grad greatly saddens me. Now, outside of government, at the U.S. Institute of Peace and at the Atlantic Council, I'm dedicated to working with scholars, activists, policymakers, and members of international civil society, including faith communities, to figure out how we on the outside can most effectively support nonviolent struggles for freedom and dignity. Today, Syrians are fighting multiple fronts. As I wrote recently in Sojourners, Syrian women, youth, religious leaders, and others are fighting ISIS extremism and the regime with bold and creative forms of civil disobedience and non-cooperation in places like Raqqa, Idlib, and Aleppo, and in the Iraqi city of Mosul. We should assist them by amplifying their efforts in the media, by supporting homegrown satire to challenge ISIS legitimacy, supporting women's local leadership, helping the populations learn about how to organize nonviolently under profound repression, and helping to bring together peacemakers from across the conflict lines. Hope for ending serious civil war and undermining violent extremism lies in the nonviolent catalysts who continue to struggle against all odds. We have a responsibility to assist them and others around the world fighting injustice and oppression with nonviolent weapons. That, for me, is the meaning of putting faith in action. Thank you.